Good afternoon. I'm Bob Gillen, the head of the Western Kansas Ag Research Centers. And on behalf of all of our faculty and staff, I'd like to welcome you all to our first virtual field day at the Southwest Research and Extension Center at Garden City. As with so many things in society, we've had to do things a lot differently since mid-March. And rather than stack a bunch of us together on hay bales and trailers, uh, we feel like it's a little bit better this year to do this digital outreach. It'll obviously be the first time that we've ever tried this. I think it'll go smoothly. However, one thing that hasn't changed is our goal is still to work on relevant problems that producers and consultants have that they're facing today. And we want to, to try and get information into your hands as quickly as possible on the problems that we're working on and possible solutions. And again, information that you can use. Also, I've, I've said many times in the past, we always welcome feedback, uh, suggestions and questions from producers and others in the ag industry on the things that we need to be working on that can help you the most. With that, again, I appreciate the time you, you've taken to spend with us today. And now let's move on to your actual presentations. Hello, I'm Dr. Sarah Zukoff. I'm an associate professor at Kansas State University in the Department of Entomology, and I am located in Garden City at the Southwest Research and Extension Center. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the crop pests that we've been seeing, uh, some new pests, and what's new with some old pests, and some things to come. So stay tuned. All right, let's start off talking about some new pests. So before I go into talking about crop pests, I do want to bring up a pest of a honeybee that has been found in the United States, specifically the murder hornet. So this hornet, uh, aka the Asian giant hornet, was found in the Pacific Northwest. Now I've gotten a lot of calls on it um, for here in Kansas, and I've had a lot of different insects brought in as potential murder hornets. Um, most of the time, what ends up being so-called murder hornets are indeed our native insects, um, one of them being cicada killers. Uh, we've also seen bumblebees brought in, yellow jackets, paper wasps, and bald-faced hornets brought in, none of which have been the murder hornet. So the murder hornet, the giant hornet, it's not found in Kansas, and it will not be found in the High Plains anytime soon, as it really requires um, the temperature and humidity and, and lots of tree cover um, that's indicative to the Pacific Northwest. So I just want to throw that out there, that we do not have the murder hornet, and we will not have the murder hornet in our area um, unless global warming severely changes the way Kansas is and we get to a lot of moisture and trees. So. With that, I will just continue on into crop pests. So we have a new pest of soybeans um, potentially coming to Kansas. It was first detected in 2018 in Nebraska, in eastern Nebraska, and it's since been making um, quite the problem for farmers. Uh, there's been anywhere from just a, a few parts of the field damage to 100% of fields damaged from this new pest. And so if you look at this kind of inner picture here, you can see the larva inside, just barely inside the, the sheath of that stalk. Um, and primarily you'll want to look for uh, dying or, or dead branches or whole plants. And if you look kind of underneath, you'll see these, these maggots inside. The plants are often going to be discolored at the base. And so you'll want to look for that wilting and um, that dark colored base. So it's unclear whether this pest is really going to show up much in Kansas this year or next year, um, but it has been found in Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, Missouri, and some other states. And so this is kind of an emerging problem. And we don't have any idea whether it will persist in the areas where the economic losses are actually happening or if it's going to spread to other areas from that. So there's a lot of unknowns about this pest um, so far. So here's another view of this pest. So if you open the stalks, you can see the maggots inside and they're, they're pretty easily detected when there's damage. 
And so we, we basically expect this pest to expand down from Nebraska into eastern Kansas. Um, we expect that we'll see more and more of this as time goes by. What we found so far is C treatments are not effective and foliar applications are possible, um, but we have a lot more research that needs to be done on those. There is a couple studies out right now and at the end of the soybean season, we'll really be able to tell some more management recommendations for this pest, but currently there really isn't um, any good management tactics. So if you do see this pest, the soybean gall midge, please tell your county agent or report to KSU Entomology immediately um, so we can start tracking its progress across the state. So let's talk a little bit about a new little pest that has been popping up across Kansas um, for the past couple years very spontaneously um, and causing some damage in different crops. So this is the trochanter mealybug. We actually have two species in Kansas. There's the eastern and the western trochanter mealybug. So this is a pest of soybeans, corn, sorghum, alfalfa, and probably other crops as well. But again, it's very spontaneous. There's very little data on this species, but we do know that the damage um, when they're in very high numbers can resemble potassium deficiency. And so these, these yellow leaves is what kind of points to it. And so a lot of times we'll have yellowing leaves and crops, but there'll be no reason for it. And so if you pull up the roots, you can actually see these inside the roots and that's where they live. So here is the little highways that ants move these mealybugs around. So here is a picture of an ant. It's got actually a little bit of um, a little tiny mealybug in its mouth. It's a baby. And then here's the adults. Um, it moves them around on these highways uh, throughout the soil and moves them in between different fields. Um, fields like alfalfa that stay um, for several years uh, actually have more of an accumulation of these, but again, there's a lot we don't know about this pest. So what do you look for when you're actually looking for these mealybugs? Well, if you pull up the roots, you can see little clumps of these that will be on the outside of the roots. They do not bore inside the roots. Um, they basically just suck on the plant like an aphid would, and they are actually relatives of aphids. So these mealybugs uh, can usually be clumped. They can usually be found in little colonies. And oftentimes they'll be found again with their ants. And this picture has ants and their babies. Um, these are the babies baby ants in the picture. And what happens is the ants actually feed off the honeydew. Um, so they use these mealybugs as a food source. And so wherever the, the trochanter mealybugs are, you will find these ants because the ants again move them around from field to field. And of course, we can't talk about new pests without talking about the sugarcane aphid. So it has been kind of on the back burner for several months now. However, we are starting to see an influx of the sugarcane aphids into South Central and Western Kansas. In addition to these aphids, we've had a superabundance of the corn leaf aphid in sorghum. Now the corn leaf aphid is often mistaken for the sugarcane aphid, but the corn leaf aphid will often infest the whorls of sorghum, while the sugarcane aphid usually prefers the leaves. Um, it doesn't usually like to be in the whorl. And it will move into the head later in the season if the leaves start to dry, but they do prefer the leaves. So we need to start looking out for the sugarcane aphid. And of course, here is the sugarcane aphid up close. The corn leaf aphid can vary from dark to light uh, green with these little dark cornicles back here, uh, but you do see it differs from the sugarcane aphid. Uh, so we want to keep an eye out for those. We also have the yellow sugarcane aphid, which is a different species in Kansas, and it's often found in the same areas that these other two are, but it's not as big of a deal as the sugarcane aphid. Um, it does tend to do a little more damage than corn leaf aphids, but it's a sporadic pest. And of course, we still have green bugs, and I have been getting reports of green bugs as well. Now this is where we've found them so far in Kansas. I'm sure there are other counties that will pop up very soon this week, if not next. They are moving in pretty heavy, so we do want to start scouting for them a little more often and make sure that they're not building up in fields. 
The threshold, the general threshold that we use for these aphids is around 40 aphids uh, per leaf in about 20 to 30 percent of the plants. And so if it is younger, you'll want to be a little more conservative. If it's older sorghum, you can be on the, uh, the later end of that. So you can see the parasitoid right about there going around and laying eggs inside the sugarcane aphids. And I've gotten a lot of questions about parasitoids and if we can expect them to actually take care of the sugarcane aphids when they move into areas. The answer is sometimes. So there are still populations that we are finding that are resistant to any parasitoids. And there are some areas that are the parasitoids can actually lay eggs inside the aphids and survive and be fine and kill those aphids. It's just kind of a mixed bag out there um, in what I've seen in the field. And of course, we all want to be sure that we are looking very carefully to make sure that they're not corn leaf aphids and that they are indeed sugarcane aphids. Over here, you can see the honeydew and the shed skins. Over here, you can see the honeydew and the shed skins. The difference between these two pictures is that on the left hand side, it is actually sugarcane aphids that are active and it happens to be at threshold in this field. In this one, there are actually no active aphids feeding and in fact that damage came from corn leaf aphids, not sugarcane aphids. So we want to be sure that we have active colonies and that they're meeting threshold and that in fact it is the sugarcane aphid and not the corn leaf aphid before we pull the trigger. And there's some other new aphids in sorghum as well, aside from the sugarcane aphid that we've been seeing pop up over the last two or three years. Uh, this new aphid in particular is the hedgehog aphid. So if you look carefully, you can see this red damage that kind of green bugs show as well. And if you zoom in, you can see the little hedgehog aphids. So it's unclear if this if this aphid is really going to cause an issue or not, um, but we do want to look out for it nonetheless and count it in addition to other aphids when we're looking at damage. Also, we have rusty plum aphids showing up in sorghum as well. And so these are just two new aphids that are, are usually found in other areas, but they've been migrating into Kansas lately and we've been seeing more and more of them. So just wanted to make you aware of them in case you see them, you know what they are. So another pest that we've been seeing more and more in Kansas is the sorghum midge. It is something we've seen sporadically over the years. However, the past couple years, we've seen it consistently um, coming up into Kansas. And so what we want to look for for the sorghum midge is the adults. You got to catch them before they lay eggs. If they lay eggs, then it's pretty much too late because the larvae feed inside the developing seed. And if you try to spray insecticides, cannot penetrate into the developing seed and it's impossible to, to kill them. So the only way you can control them is by killing the adults. And so to scout for these pests, you want to take a plastic gallon, gallon size bag, put it over a flowering head because they are attracted only to flowering heads, these adults. And you want to shake the bag with the head in it a little bit. And you'll see any of the midges that are hanging out on that plant as it's flowering, it will, they'll fly off up into the bag. And so this has been confirmed this past two weeks in Finney County. So I'm sure they're found elsewhere right now um, in the southwest part of Kansas, maybe further north. Um, but if you do find these, you want to be able to treat them with uh, something that isn't going to flare sugarcane aphids if you have those in the field as well. So just keep that in mind as you're out scouting and looking for these, these midges. So the threshold of the sorghum midge is 30%. So you want to look for adults in the flowering heads. The problem, of course, is that sorghum flowers at different times. The top and the bottom and the middle all flower at different times. So be sure you're actually scouting at these different flowering stages and looking for these adult midges. A great way to find if you've, you've already had them is looking at the shed skins and the pupa that are hanging outside of the developing seed 
seeds. If you see these, well, it's too late and you've already had an infestation of them, but at least you know that they were there. Um, after a couple windstorms, these will blow away, but a lot of times they'll be there um, and you can see them. And so you'll often see the adult midges hanging out after that. And of course, it's good to know. Oftentimes, farmers won't realize that they've had an infestation in our area of the sorghum midge because we haven't really had to deal with them a whole lot prior to the last couple of years. So at the end of the season, farmers are, are coming out in their fields and trying to harvest and they end up with things like this um, and all the seeds have not developed. So unfortunately, um, we're going to probably see more of that this next year. Um, I wanted to point out that this is different than bird damage. And so if we look up close, we can actually see the seeds of the sorghumage are not actually developed. They, they never were there. It's empty. But if you look at the close up of bird damage, the seeds were there and the seeds have been plucked out. And of course, another telltale sign of a pest that we know and love, or I should say hate, is the corn earworm or headworms. This damage right here is from headworms. And with damage to the seeds from headworms, we will often see grain molds move in. Here is some pictures of the grain mold. On this side is one that has also sorghum midge damage and just did not have any seeds in it. And this one uh, had headworms and had the grain mold as well. And speaking of corn earworm and headworms, let's now move on to what's new with old pests. So there's been a lot of questions that have come in to me about when corn earworms and fall armyworms are really a problem and when do they actually need to be treated. First, just a reminder that corn earworms can come in a variety of colors. I've gotten several calls on corn earworms this year and they all seem to be different colors than what we normally see. So just a reminder, there's a lot of different colors of them out there. So in corn ears, I've gotten a lot of calls about corn earworms having multiple per ear, despite the fact that they usually will consume each other. Um, and so what happens in the BT is they actually get drunk, so to speak, off the BT, and they will not feed on each other when that's the case. Interestingly, when you take them off the BT and put them together, they will consume each other pretty readily. Now, ragworm feeding by the larva in the whirl has been a big thing that we've been seeing the last couple of weeks. And usually it's not worth spraying these for a couple of reasons. By the time the leaves unfurl, usually the damage is already visible, but the larva have done their feeding damage and they're done. Um, the other reason is insecticides can't penetrate down far enough into the whirl to actually kill the larva. And if a general insecticide is killed, most of the time that will just wipe out your beneficials and we don't want that. So the, the ragged looking leaves at this stage usually have no effect on yield. And so if you're trying to kill them just to get rid of the next generation, that won't work because these pests actually migrate into our area. And so overall, it's just not worth spraying when you have ragworms, aka corn earworms. Now in sorghum heads, we do want to treat when the larvae are small and you can see the feeding in the circled areas. Usually about one to two per head is the threshold because at this we have five to 10% yield loss. So it is worth spraying in the head when the larvae are small. When the larvae are older, um, it is not worth spraying because they're about to pupate and the damage has already been done. And as a reminder, there is a new product called Helogen by Ag Biotech, and it kills headworms in sorghum. It takes a few days for it to die, but it is a good product that we have seen work very well in Kansas. It's interesting because under the right kind of moisture, this Helogen, the virus, will actually kill the headworms um, for several uh, several weeks because they'll just keep infecting the new headworms that come in. So it is a product that I would recommend for a good biocontrol program. So the last pest I want to talk about is the alfalfa weevil. 
In many states, they've reported problems with poor residual control and larval survival of both pyrethroid lambda cyhalothrin and cobalt, which is chloropyrifos plus lambda cyhalothrin. And so we tested the alfalfa weevils in Kansas in several locations this year and confirmed that we do have lambda cyhalothrin resistance um, across Kansas. And we were not able to test cobalt yet, but hopefully that can be done in the future. And so I wanted to make everybody aware of this as it is pretty much going to be a problem across Kansas. So we did have a particularly bad year of the alfalfa weevil in several areas in western Kansas. And I do suspect that part of the reason we were having such problems is because we were having sprays that were going out that weren't working. But there are also problems associated with this weevil actually coming out uh, in a more spread out pattern than we normally see. So they were coming out and feeding on the alfalfa, reproducing very quickly, and we were seeing a lot of damage across the state from them. And on top of these problems with alfalfa weevil, we had widespread freezes early on in the season in the alfalfa as well. Thankfully, alfalfa is a resilient crop, and this is the same field you could see. It had both damage from the weevil as well as freeze damage, and it came back. As a reminder, I would like to mention that we have insect management guides out uh, for every crop. And so if you have a problem with a pest, these management guides will help you out. They're on the K-State website. Uh, the best way to find them is actually go to Google and say Alfalfa Insect Management Guide K-State, and it'll pop right up. And a handy thing about these guides is they do have insecticides in them and their rates for every pest and every crop. So if you have bug questions, you can go to these four lovely folks. In western Kansas, there's Anthony Zukoff and J.P. Michaud and Hayes. In eastern Kansas, there's Brian McCornack and Jeff Whitworth. If you have problems with crop pests, if you'll notice, I am not on this list. And that is because I am saying goodbye to Kansas State University. I will be moving in a week to California and starting my new position over there. I've enjoyed working with enjoyed working with all of you immensely, and I hope you have a wonderful year. Hi, my name is John Holman, and I am a professor in the agronomy department at Kansas State University. I'm located out here in western Kansas at the Garden City Research Extension Center. And today we're going to be looking at a long-term cover crop experiment. This study was initiated in 2006, so we're 14 years into this long-term study. And behind me, um, we're, and we'll look at some a little bit of the plot area around, around me today, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about this long-term experiment. In, in our area, uh, it is the longest running cover crop experiment, to my knowledge, in the High Plains region. And, and so we've generated a lot of very useful information from this, from this experiment. What started us on this project was that we know uh, that moisture is our most limiting factor in dryland, dryland uh, cropping systems of the area. And we only store about 20 to 25 percent of our soil water, uh, the precipitation we, we receive during the fallow period if we use tillage. If we do things such as no-till, um, using a stripper header, and those types of things, then we might bump that efficiency up to about 30%. So we're still losing 70 to 75% of our moisture out of the system. And we were interested in seeing if we could improve that efficiency. If we can improve the efficiency and, and store more soil water, then of course that's going to help our, with our crop yields. The other reason for having such a long-term uh, experiment is we, were, we wanted to look at the long-term uh, changes in soil, soil health. So this study is a uh, wheat sorghum in a wheat sorghum fallow rotation which is common for the, for the area. We have every crop phase present every year. What, and what that means is every year we're growing a wheat crop, every year we're growing a grain sorghum crop, and every year we have uh, the fallow period. And the, the reason for that is we all know that every year is, is different. Every, some years we're extremely dry and some years we're, we are blessed with a lot of moisture. And so by having every crop present every year, we can look at, at how, 
how this system performs across all those different uh, environmental conditions. The other thing that we uh, have done is we were looking at growing a cover crop in the in our in our what we call our fallow phase or that fallow year and uh, planting a, a, a cover crop in the spring uh, time ahead of the wheat crop wheat planting in the fall and we've also looked at growing a cover crop uh, post wheat so after wheat harvest we grow a cover crop first of all one of the things that we do is we use a stripper header when cutting cutting the, the wheat and you can see here what that does uh, it, you know, leaves all the, the as much straw as uh, stem in the it, uh, standing as possible, and we're doing that to, to maximize the amount of residue in the field. And then behind me, um, the first uh, cover crop phase we will talk about is growing a cover crop uh, into uh, post post wheat. And so, if you want to look down in here, you can see the uh, this is forage sorghum growing. In, in wheat stubble. This was planted right after wheat. And so um, we've had pretty good success getting a cover crop established uh, right after uh, wheat stubble. Of course, this year has been, we've had a lot of moisture later in the season. Typically, um, with this forage sorghum crop grown after wheat, the yield potential of it is about half what a full season crop would be. Um, when we, and we're, we have this, the next year we have we're growing both either we're either growing grain sorghum or forage sorghum the year following wheat when we grow grain sorghum uh, what we see is about a 40 percent reduction in the grain sorghum yield by growing a cover crop post wheat so that cover crop post wheat is using soil water and that's reducing the grain sorghum yield pretty pretty significantly that second year now if we grow a forage sorghum crop that second year instead of grain sorghum, we do not have, there's no yield penalty on that forage sorghum crop. So it requires, we know that, and, and the reason being is a forage crop requires less water to grow than a grain crop. A forage crop, you only have to have grow biomass. With a grain crop, you have to grow, grow, grow biomass plus, plus grain. So it requires, it's a longer growing period, requires more water uh, to, to meet that, that, that water need. So we are able to intensify the, the cropping system uh, easier in, in, in moisture limited regions by, by growing a, by growing, by including forages and using forages in the rotation. Now we've also looked at growing uh, sp spring cover crops uh, ahead, ahead of wheat. And what we have found there really depends on uh, the, 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 the year. In, in high moisture years, we have not seen any negative impact on wheat yields. We have, not, we have yet to see a positive impact on wheat yields in our, in our area. Uh, if, you, if you go to higher rainfall areas uh, where they have seen an increase in crop yield, that's typically due to nitrogen being deficient in the system and by growing a legume uh, in, in the rotation. But in our area, um, when we have the high rainfall, like I said, we have not seen a, uh, uh, we do not see any positive or negative impact on the wheat yield. However, when conditions are extremely dry, which they can be, uh, we have measured greater than 70% reduction in that wheat crop. And so, um, and the reason, be, reason being again is this is all, this whole system is being driven by soil water. And what can happen is if we go back and look at the wheat stubble here again for just a second, we have, we have very good residue here right now. And um, if we look across the way here, you can see the sorghum, the sorghum stalks from, grain sorghum stalks from, from last year. And you can see the amount of residue there. And you can see some of the, the uh, cover crop residue in the green out there from the spring cover crops that are some little bit of regrowth. Um, what we what we see what can happen is, is is you know we have very good conditions we have this residue we have grain sorghum stalks and what can happen is is in a in a real dry year we can we can we if we run a drill through this you know we will destroy a lot of our crop residue and if it's extremely dry we will plant that cover crop and the cover crop will not come up. So 
in, in those real bad conditions, we can actually take a bad situation and make it worse by destroying that crop residue. So we have to be very careful. Um, what we have started to do is what is, is a practice that, we, that, that I am calling flex fallow. And what that means is, is in the spring of the year, I take a look at what the long-term uh, weather forecast is calling for for the, for, the, for, the next, for the next 12 months. And then we also take a, uh, a soil probe and we just use a Paul Brown probe that, uh, that any, anybody can, can buy for very little money. Just, it's just a simple hand probe, stick in the ground. A lot of farmers already have them. Um, stick that in the ground and we measure how much, uh, is, how much soil water is in the profile. And if we, have a, if, that, if we can get that probe in the ground, at least a foot, and, and the forecast is calling for neutral or favorable conditions, we'll go ahead and, and plant the cover crop. However, if, if, if the uh, field is dry, so we don't have anything to, to grow a crop on, or if it's calling for th conditions to turn dry or be dry, then we will uh, crop less intensively, leave it fallow, and, and, and then plant wheat that fall. Here we are. Uh, grain sorghum here in front of me and and a full season forage sorghum crop behind me and so this is looking at that second year of the of the rotation whether we grow the grain sorghum crop or the forage sorghum crop now the one thing that we have found uh, growing the, the cover crop either the, the post wheat that we just looked at or growing the cover crop in the spring time of the year ahead of, of wheat uh, We've looked at growing a true cover crop, meaning we grow that crop for cover and we spray, we terminate it with a herbicide and we leave it standing. And then right side by side, we've also grown that crop for, for forage and we, we harvest it. Uh, we take samples and we harvest it with a swather and, and baler uh, to, to, look at, to look at hay production. And we're all into some other uh, work and with some colleagues. We're also looking uh, at, at grazing. So we've looked at the, uh, the forage, forage potential and cover crop potential. When we look at the economics of the system over many years, um, when we look at the cover crop itself, that always has uh, netted less dollars than, than, than just chem fallow. And the reason being, again, is because we, we see that slight reduction uh, or can be significant reduction in, in, in the following crop after the cover crop. However, if we grow that cover crop for forage, now that forage is able to provide us an economic return. And that system can be uh, more profitable than, than, than chem fallow, um, given, given a few conditions. One is in order for forages to pay you, you get you have to have something that produces good tonnage. So some of these some species do not produce very good tonnage. Uh, your grass species uh, will produce in, in general the most the most tonnage. So that would be like the the forage organ behind me. Uh, could be spring oats, spring or winter triticale, uh, barley. Those are all going to produce good tonnage. Things like peas or clover um, those are those those are legumes but they do not produce the tonnage that the grass crop does and so that when you when you have fewer tons to sell it, it, it makes the system less profitable we're harvesting all of this at at an at the uh, when right when the grass starts to head and so the forage quality of all of this is, is is really pretty good so even though the legumes can have a slightly higher forage quality we're cutting the grasses at a time, uh, at a crop maturity stage, where it's where it's high forage quality and and, and easily meeting the needs of most most animals, uh, and, and we could supplement that if we need to with a little bit of a little bit of protein. What we found though is is in those very very dry years, where we don't where we do not grow, where we plant maybe plant this cover crop or forage crop and it fails to establish and we see a reduction in wheat yield, then under those conditions. Um, that growing a forage crop will return less economic profit than just leaving it fallow. So again, that flex fallow concept uh, is, is something that we, that we are working on and that shows very good promise. Um, unfortunately, the, the predictability of the weather is not the best. And so, 
you know there's going to be years that you're going to uh, err on either side of that where it start where you think it's dry and it starts to rain or or where it's uh, uh, wet and turn, turns dry so um, so there is you know it's, it's not perfect but it does help eliminate some of those really really bad years lastly I want to talk a little bit about soil soil health since this study has been in for so many years we've been able to uh, be able to track changes in soil health over time and what we have seen is, is again, it, it really kind of tracks um, the productivity of the system. And so in some real favorable years, we were starting to see an improvement in soil organic carbon, which would uh, be, is the building block for increasing soil organic matter uh, by growing a cover crop or forages. We've not seen any difference between growing the, the cover crop or forage. When we grow that crop, uh, forage crop, you have to keep in mind that, you know, six, 40 to 60 percent of that plant material is, is in the roots below below ground plus we also have we're not removing all the residue so a forage crop is still putting a lot of residue into the system but ha what happened is is when we went into the dry years uh, we saw those that 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 trend change and 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 go back the other way and to, to right now where we do not see any difference in in where we have a cover or not have a cover and the reason being is, is by growing that cover crop, that residue that we're growing there, quite often uh, the, the following grain crop is, is hurt um, from, in terms of its biomass production and grain yield. And so what we gain on one, hand, one side, we're losing, we're losing on the other, unfortunately. Um, you know, with, when we did have good soil moist, good precipitation, like I said, we were starting to see a slight improvement in soil organic carbon and starting to see a slight improvement in, in bulk density, which, is, which helps reduce the potential for soil erosion. So even though there is a potential there, those dry years, um, we, we, lose that, we lose that gain. The other, the other point we'll talk a little bit about is soil water, because this is sometimes a question I, I get. Um, you know, anytime you grow, grow something, whether it be a crop, cover crop, or weeds, that all uses so, soil water. Um, where we have looked at a high, a high residue cover crop after we terminate it, uh, there is an improvement in, in soil water uh, fallow efficiency. So we are storing a little bit more soil water there. However, that's never been enough to make up for the amount of water it, it took to grow that crop. So unfortunately, uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the time period of growing the cover crop, uh, we always have less soil water to work with for that subsequent cover, 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 or the subsequent cash crop. Thank you, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, present to you today and I uh, look forward to catching you in person. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Aguilar and I'm a water resource engineer and welcome to our cotton field virtual tour. Yes, you've heard it right, it's cotton. So we tried it last year and we are going to sh share with you some of the, the lessons that we've learned so far. Uh, with me that uh, I, I was able to also record was uh, Randy and we'll, she, he will talk about some of the weed issues. And I uh, would like to acknowledge some people uh, that have been uh, part of this project, like Stu, Lucas, Alexi, Bill, and Sarah, and also some of our uh, contributors that have made this project uh, successful. So my, my purpose today is to be able to share with you some of the thoughts that we had, the experiences that we had for the past year, uh, and also bring you over to our cotton field so that you could at least see uh, even virtually uh, some of the things that are going on in our field. So I think one of the first questions that we usually have is what is the cotton research and why are we doing it? So first of all, uh, we know that there is some water resources, uh, some water resource uh, issues that we have to deal with. And so that's the reason why we are going to look at cotton, which is one of the considered uh, drought tolerant crops in the region. Uh, we've seen that, uh, that there has been a big uh, great, uh, growth in, in the region. Uh, 2015, there was only 16,000 acres. Uh, and by 2019, it has uh, more than doubled. It's tenfold 
uh, in terms of its acreage. Uh, the availability of varieties, uh, with, particularly with regards to herbicide tolerance and shorter season requirement, has been another reason why we are looking at this uh, cotton in our region. And uh, it's no wonder also that uh, the Kansas Water Vision also uh, states that cotton is an important resource that we should be looking at. Uh, and we've had several calls from USDA RMA wherein they are looking for uh, cotton data, particularly that uh, some of the counties are starting to plant them. Uh, that was about 2018 and 2017. Uh, so we said that uh, KSRE is really poised to do this. And so we've talked to other people and uh, here we are uh, doing some cotton research in Garden City. So we started with the basic questions. Uh, will cotton grow or not in Garden City area? And if it grows, will it have a decent yield? And at the same time, uh, if it does going to have decent yield, when should we start planting cotton? So those are some of the basic question, questions that we throw to ourselves uh, when we started this research. So uh, in 2019, we planted two plots. Uh, we pythogen to 10 seeds. Uh, one is on May 15th, we call it the early plot. And May 30th, uh, about 15 days later, uh, our late plot. So during the early, uh, early plot, at uh, the early plot, we know that our soil temperature was just right. However, right after we planted, the temperature dipped down to uh, unfavorable temperature, uh, temp uh, colder temperature. Um, and so we only had about 10% germination, and so we had to abandon, abandon it. Uh, late plot, the later planted plot, uh, we get about 43% germination because we know that at the time that we uh, planted it, the soil temperature was just iffy uh, right around that, uh, that borderline. But right after we planted it, the temperature went up, and so there were some heat units that were achieved. So we get about 43%. Uh, germination for that late plot. And so the rest of the data that we are going to talk about are regarding the, the late plot that we had. The seeding rate was around 55,000 seeds per acre. Uh, we've got irrigation treatments, uh, about six of them, uh, from dryland to full, and at the same time, uh, some strategic uh, uh, planting, which we, we refer to as, uh, um, uh, uh, which I will uh, describe later on. So the early plot was planted on corn stubble and the late plot was planted to uh, sorghum stubble. So I will not be talking a lot about uh, the, uh, the agronomics of the cotton. If you would like to know more about it, the, Stu Duncan has, uh, has presented this at the, during the Governor's Water Conference in 2019. And you could, I have the link here that you could uh, follow and uh, download it. But I just want to point out here that there's uh, personally, I'm still learning about the, the crop stages of cotton, uh, and it has something to do with the timing, with the days after, uh, also with the days after it was planted, at, at the same time before and after bloom as well. So uh, looking at more at the water, uh, at the water use, uh, we know that it has also a very similar curve with cor corn or sorghum. Uh, wherein it picks up during the time that it's bloom and then tries to fall down as during the time that it is maturing. So we know that there are some strategic uh, time, timing here that we should be looking at. In particular, we are following the research that uh, Lucas Hag and uh, student can, did in Moscow for about five to six years, wherein they were looking at the possibility of putting an inch to one an inch or two to one of the critical stages and one of those that uh, they were able to identify is match head square an inch during the match head square and there is a significant difference with it compared with the dryland uh dryland uh, uh treatments and on on average there was about 250 uh bushels of per acre of of advantage compared with the dryland uh, they have also looked at putting in another inch during bloom, but uh, it actually so in some years it has depressed the the yield on on that cotton. So we know that there is some advantage on strategic application of that water. So 
right, right now we are going to uh, bring you over to the field and at the same time talk with our weed scientist regarding weed pressure. We are about a mile or two away from US Highway 50 and that used to be the farthest north of where we could grow cotton. And last year we started to plant cotton here just to know if it is going to be successful or not. And so far, what we have found is that we could successfully grow cotton here in our area. As you could see here, we've got cottons again this year. And this was planted sometime in May 15th. And it was just the right time, the right temperature, the right moisture. And it is growing very well in this, in this area. We have several questions that you would like to ask here in our fields. Last year, the main question that we have is that, is it going to grow? So we planted one on May 15th and the other on May 30th. Unfortunately, last year, uh, May 15th wasn't the best time to plant cotton in this region. We had only about 10% germination and we have to abandon the field. Fortunately, we have a second planting date, which is June 30th, and that field had a germination rate of about 43%. And so we continued and have some yield at the end of the, of the year. I am standing here right now in between two plots. One is what we call a variety plots, wherein part of it has been planted with different varieties, but one of them is still the same variety that we have planted throughout all of our field, the Phytogen 210. This was planted around May 15th when the temperature and the weather was just right. About 10 days after, we came back and planted this strip of field or, or this plot. This is what we call a differential irrigation plot. We are going to implement different irrigation um, irrigation treatment here from dry land to full irrigation but what you could see here also is the differences in terms of its growth and germination just based on the planting dates again as I mentioned this one has been planted as early as possible which is around May 15th for this region and this one was planted about 10 days after uh, with the same almost condition and you could see that one we have a difficulty of germinating them uh, during that time and the other thing is that we have a relatively uh, low stand on this side of the field so one thing that we have learned in this region is that timing particularly the planting timing is really very critical you would like to have it as early as possible at the right optimal condition so that you could get the most out of the growth of cotton. So one of the main lessons that we have learned when planting with cotton is that germination is really very critical and so we should be looking at all of the weather parameters, the soil temperature, the moisture, the herbicide, and all of those things should be very, uh, should, should be important in order for us to have a successful stand of of cotton. The other thing that we, will, we would like to mention is that the, uh, the seeding rate is also critical. Uh, what we have found out that the typical recommendation for seeding rate is about 55,000 seeds per acre. Uh, last year we think that that may be on a lower side as you go farther north, particularly in this region. So this year we have tried two seeding rates. One is 55,000 and one is 65,000. Just trying to figure out what is the sweet spot for that nice germination of the, of the corn. So basically we have two treatments. One is based on the seeding rate. The other is based on the, um, on the planting date. So we are trying to figure out for you the best time of the year to be able to plant at the same time what is the best seeding rate. This cotton field is located in Finnup, about two miles away from the Garden City proper. And it is a, an irrigation research field by the K-State Southwest Research and Extension. Here in this field, we are in a, what we call a center pivot. 
uh, where we are able to apply different amounts of water with four different types of modes of application. But on this particular field, we are focusing a, li a little bit more on cotton with two major treatments here. One is that we have different population rate. We have rates of 65,000 per acre and 55,000 per acre. And as we know that as we go further north, the temperature and the weather is going to be very critical for the cotton crop. And so we are trying to figure out if 55,000 or 65,000 or some other population rate is the most optimum population for this region. On top of that, we also have two, four different modes of application of water. We've got a mobile drip irrigation that is emitting one gallon per hour. A mobile drip irrigation emitting two gallons per hour. A bubbler and also a LISA, what we call a LISA or a um, spray mode. So we have those taken care of in this region. Uh, we are hoping that this uh, different application would not have a drastic differences in terms of its effect on cotton, but who knows, we are trying to research it for you so that you will know also the best way to be able to grow cotton with the different nozzle packages that you might be using at. We hope to be able to share by the end of the year uh, some of the results that we have learned from this field. Thank you very much and uh, we hope that we have imparted something for you uh, this year. I think that uh, I had a really good old farmer when I first got out of college. He said he likes that pre-emergency herbicide. So pre-emergence herbicide followed by a post-emergence herbicide has always been a good plan. And uh, we did, we put uh, Valor and Dicamba on ahead of planting cotton last year and then put Dual down as a, as a pre prior to planting cotton and that wasn't quite enough. Our weed control really, and then of course we used the, the, the 2,4-D and, and Roundup over the top with the resistant seed and that was good. The control was good but it wasn't quite enough. So this year we put, we brought more to the picnic. So we've got a we got a really old herbicide. I think that herbicide is from the seventies, Cotteran. It's an old pre-emergence herbicide, and we added that to the Valor and the Dicamba prior to planting the cotton. And then after planting cotton, we added much more Cotteran. I'd never used Cotteran before, and I had no idea how high a rate you could use. But we used the highest maximum rate, split in two shots, and. Uh, the weed control on that was outstanding. There are spots in the field where some varmint ate the cotton, so there's dead spots in the cotton, and there's no weeds in the dead spots. So if you see bare ground and it didn't have weeds in it, that's the gold standard for weed control. We didn't quite know what, where we were going to plant what, and we planted wheat, and we had a, a very thin wheat cover crop that went in that we planted the cotton into, and I think that made a, a tremendous difference. Uh, I've been doing research over the last couple of decades with wheat as a cover crop prior to planting all kinds of row crops and I have gosh six years of data showing that wheat alone gives us excellent control of kosher uh, and that is kosher is the is what's driving the model out here for resistance but we have kosher that's resistant to star rain atrazine all of the ALS herbicides roundup and I have some that, that, that seems to be tolerant in dicamba as well. So we have to bring another tool to the picnic, and I think that a wheat cover crop part of planting is, is a good thing. Uh, cotton is really uh, drought tolerant, so we, we have shown that, that a wheat cover crop applied prior to planting corn increases yield even at the deficit of the water that the wheat cover crop uses. So the, it, it's kind of it's kind of odd for me to think that I can throw water away and make water. But the, the advantage of a wheat cover crop in corn is increased water use efficiency at tassel. So the water we do use, we use more efficiently with in corn. Now in cotton, which is a much more water efficient crop, it would seem to me that the, the, the deficit of growing the wheat cover crop would be even less. So I think that the uh, wheat cover crop prior to planting the uh,
kind of looks like a no-brainer to me. Uh, there's a lot of research out there with dozens of different mixtures of, of peas and canola and all kinds of things out there and with $15 price tags. Uh, I have yet to see any information that shows me that uh, wheat is not just as good as all the fancy expensive cover crops. So you got the wheat, it ain't selling very, very much. It's, uh, if you can clean up your own wheat and plant it for a cover crop, it looks like a no-brainer to me. You know, I'm a weed guy. It looks to me like there's agronomic questions in cotton that I, I'm uncomfortable with. Uh, it looks to me like elevation is as important as, as, as latitude. You know, Garden City is a little higher elevation. You know, there are places that are growing cotton in Kansas that are further north. But if you look at them, they're a 1,000 feet lower in altitude. And uh, everybody's ever been to field day. Can't have field day tell you tell them what's the best weed control? Dark. So getting that cotton to pop up out of the ground and getting the canopy is the best possible thing for weed control and the best possible thing for cotton. Well, the last year we, we did push the envelope on population. I, I, did we do 40,000 last year? 55,000. Last year? Yes. Yeah, and then more. More's better. And I don't know. Sixty-five. We tried. Sixty-five, 65 is great. Because you got if you get if you could get fifty-five and you get every one of them to pop out of the ground four days after you planted it, fifty would be plenty. But you know, cotton is is a little tricky to get it to come out of the ground. So the quicker you get that ground covered, the better off you are. Now I have no idea whether the cost of the cotton seed covers all that or not. That's I'm a weed guy. I'm not an economist. But it looks to me like if you get if you get cotton's got weeds in it, you can't cut it. That don't pay the bill. You, you need to have a, a crop prior to planting cotton where you can get really good weed control. It, cotton needs to be part of a rotation where you have excellent weed control for several years prior. So similar to people that grow sunflowers. People don't ever grow sunflowers one year after another because sunflowers are not as competitive a crop. Cotton it can be a little hard, slow to come out of the ground. Uh, sometimes it doesn't canopy as quick as other crops, so it, uh, it's, it, it takes a little baby to get the cotton to, to get weed control. Welcome back. So what we're going back here is uh, about the, uh, the results that we had about uh, in the 2019. I've, I've, I've already alluded some of them a while ago during the field visit uh, in our cotton field, but uh, I would go now with the numbers. So what we have found out last year is that we've got about about 12 inches of rainfall during that time. And uh, among all of the treatments, um, actually the fully irrigated had the lowest yield and uh, possibly the lowest potential uh, or, or uh, potential gross among all of the treatments. It only got about 155 pounds per acre of length uh, during the time. Uh, the dry land surprisingly has a better uh, as a better quality, at the same time, better yield. Uh, so about 237 pounds per acre, uh, which could net you about $114 per acre when you uh, consider all of the loan averages uh, for that particular quality. Uh, the limited irrigation at 33% ET actually had, or the evapotranspiration actually had the, the best uh, yield and, uh, and quality for, for the field. Um, it has about 313 uh, pounds per acre, and uh, it could gross you almost close to 150,000. Uh, the, the, the next treatment that uh, had a, a good uh, uh, turnaround also is, uh, is the one, one inch at uh, match head square. Uh, again, both in that limited 3% evapotranspiration and on, uh, on match head square, we only put about an inch of uh, application of water. So for the match head square, it only gave, uh, it, it yielded about 263 uh, pounds per acre and has a potential gross of $119. So by no means, this is, uh, this is not a big yield uh, in, uh, compared with, uh, with the other area. Uh, for one, we only have about 40% of, um, of germination. At the same time, uh, during this year, um, uh, the, 
we we have we are just starting to learn about this this crop. Moving on, um, the so we've got some initial recommendations here that we could share with you. So first of all, what we have learned is that you have to prepare the field early on because that condition for a favorable planting condition is going to come what uh, uh, in 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 a, in a blink. So you have to be ready when you are when you are going to plant some cotton. Uh, because we are also in an, in an area wherein there might be some uh, uh, some issues with emergence or germination due to the weather conditions, uh, we would probably also recommend to lean towards the higher seeding rate. Uh, we've used a 55,000, and as I mentioned a while ago, we have used this year to, uh, to as, most, as much as 65,000 per acre just to be able to, to see what is the, uh, the sweet spot for uh, for seeding rate. Uh, we also recommend that you adapt an irrigation schedule, whether it is, a, it is an ET-based, a soil-based, or a plant-based feedback, and follow through it. Uh, have some confidence in using them because we know that if you over-irrigate, there is some penalty in terms of the yield as well as the quality of the cotton yield. Also, as you probably are aware, uh, aim to keep your field weed-free. If you are new particularly for this, for, uh, for this cotton, seek help uh, we've done that before we've done that last year we ask for help in terms of uh, knowing when to when to spray when to uh, when to apply certain chemicals on the field so have somebody that is knowledgeable to to help you with in the first year at the least so going back to our in the uh, simple questions or three questions that we had will it grow in the in the garden city area yes we definitely yes if it grows, will it, will it have a decent yield look like? Yes, uh, we know that it wasn't the best uh, growing season for cotton last year, but we still had a decent yield. So we think that it is a yes. When should you plant cotton? As slowly as the conditions are favorable because we are looking at the, uh, uh, the growing degree days uh, or the heat units. And we are right there on the border that when you lose that, uh, that opportunity, you might not have a good cotton yield. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And again, uh, be safe out there and be healthy. Uh, I wish you the best uh, for the rest of the day. Thank you. Good afternoon. I wanted to take a moment to discuss some findings from recent wild bee surveys we've been doing the last couple of seasons in Western Kansas. In particular, I wanted to share what we've found um, in close proximity to active cropland. But before we get to that, I just wanted to take a minute to touch briefly on the subject of pollinators uh, in regards to their status across the country. So pollinators, uh, wild bees in particular, have been making headlines for several years now for unfortunate reasons. Generally speaking, it's a decline uh, across the country we're seeing in bees. Um, we have about 60 bees, uh, native bees, that have been red listed, basically meaning they're threatened or imperiled in some way. And a lot of our native bees are so small, they're hard to track over time to really know what's going on. So I think it's probably a lot more than 60 species. Um, if you look at a larger, easier to track group of bees or wild bees is uh, the bumblebees. Over the course of a few decades, we've seen that four of our 40 species in North America are in danger. They're declining across their range, getting harder to find. We've had a bumblebee that's been put on the endangered species list. Uh, and one's actually thought to have gone extinct already. And studies in the last few years have shown that a lot of our cropland across the country is without the needed populations of wild pollinators to make them as fruitful as they can be. Uh, and a lot of people say, well, we have managed honeybees and they could pick up the slack, but that's not the case. Honeybees themselves are continuing to face declines, a lot of colony die-offs over winter, things like that. So honeybees can't really pick up the slack so pollinators are in trouble, having a rough time. This should matter to us. Um, almost three quarters of the world's food crops require pollinator, pollinator, pollinators. Um, in the United States, 100 crops alone need pollinators. And research in regards to these declines and how they could potentially impact our food supply or food production uh, is ongoing. Um, a recent study 
that was published in July of this year uh, it wanted to assess the extent of pollinator limitation in seven high value crops across the country. And there's a few really interesting takeaways that they, they came up with. Um, they found that wild bees are providing comparable amounts of pollination to honeybees for most crops, even in agriculturally intensive regions and even in areas where, you know, honeybees are brought in for pollination. And they saw that pollinator declines translate directly into decreased yields for many crops. And our wild bees are really contributing a lot to the pollination of these crops. It's estimated that three and three to four billion dollars a year is what our wild pollinators are providing us with. So very important overall. So with all this in mind, uh, we wanted to get out there and see what exactly we could find uh, in the Western Kansas landscape. So we went out and we surveyed bees in more natural settings. We uh, collected bees in suburban settings and we even um, collected in some edge habitat along active cropland. And those are the bees I'm going to be talking about today. And so we used a very simple technique uh, to collect bees. It's a very common technique in bee surveying. Basically, we put out a series of painted deli cups um, of various colors that are known to attract bees. And we, we put out a series of these cups along a transect in the edge habitat near some cropland. And the cups would sit out for a determined period of time. Um, and we would put soapy water in them so that when the bees were attracted to the colors, any bees in the area, they would get into the soapy water and they wouldn't be able to get out. And then we'd collect the cups and we'd process them and identify the bees in the lab. And so this is really twofold. Um, we wanted to know what was out there because bee populations, as, as well as many different uh, insect taxa, are uh, poorly understood in Western Kansas. This part of the state is just historically under collected. Um, so we just want to see what's out there. And secondly, it's important to know what's out there because we really don't know how our land use or land management is impacting these bees. If it's, you know, having a positive effect, negative effect, if we don't know what the bees were like beforehand. So if we don't have any base knowledge on the abundance and diversities of bees out there already, we really don't know how their populations are changing over time. So what did we find? Over two seasons of collecting, we ended up with 1,854 wild bee specimens, and not a single one was a honeybee. And it really was a really interesting diversity what we collected. We ended up with four different families represented in this collection. Um, North America has six families of wild bees. And we had 16 different groups among those families in the collection. And we ultimately identified 23 different species of bees just from this one location. So, and as with any wild population, the abundance of the bees is not evenly distributed. So we see we have our four families here, minor bees, bumblebees and allies, sweat bees and leafcutter bees. And just looking at the total specimens for each family, we see that the bumblebees and their allies and the sweat bees comprise a majority of the specimens. Minor bees and leafcutter bees are not very common in, in, the, in these collections. Um, now the bumblebee and allies family is one of the most diverse bee families in the world. So you can see there's a higher number of total species that kind of makes sense. The sweat bees were the most abundant. As you can see, they made up 82% of the entirety of the collection that we made. And then bumblebees and their allies were the next, the runner up there. And I just want to take a minute to highlight the sweat bees since they're the most abundant and kind of break that down and look at them a little closer. closer. Um, so there's three different groups in that family that we collected and 61% of the the sweat bees belong to a group that I'm calling the black sweat bees. Really small, sometimes gnat sized ones. We might be familiar with them. During the summer, they're attracted to your sweat and they land on people and accidentally sting them, things like that. Typically very small. Uh, and then the runner up there was the green sweat bees, which are a little big, bigger, a little more easy to, to recognize in a landscape, easy to see. But you can see almost the entirety of the sweat bees are represented by those two groups. And I also wanted to highlight them because of their known importance, especially in regards to pollination. So 
all bees are pollinators. That's true. But not all bees are going to be valuable pollinators to us in regards to food production, for, for example. Uh, bees fall into two different groups. You have some that are pollen specialists. Um, these bees are going to prefer only one flower or one group of flowers, and that's all they're going to pollinate. So it's typically a lot of wild flowers, things like that. And these bees are going to be active very briefly overall. You know, they're only out when the flower's blooming. They complete their life cycle within the entire life of that flower uh, span. So some of these specialists are only active for two, three weeks, maybe even less during the year. Pollen generalists, on the other hand, they don't really have preference. They'll pollinate and visit anything that's blooming. Um, and these bees will be active for a lot longer time during the year over multiple seasons. So that makes pollen generalists a bit more valuable for us in regards to food crops. And so what I did is I looked at all the groups that we collected and I determined if they were considered generalist pollinators or specialist pollinators. And I found that the, the minor bee family are all 100% specialists um, and they're very infrequent in our sample and they, they're only attracted to a variety of wildflowers. It was surprising to see that the bumblebee and their allies consisted of um, a lot of specialist action. Only 30% of those collected in that group were considered generalists. But then you see the sweat bees were 100% generalists, as were the leaf cutters, but they were not very abundant to make them very important. Um, but the sweat bees, you see, the most abundant bee in our sample, samples and in, in this particular location are 100% generalists. And it's important to point out that literature has shown that the sweat bee family is among one of the most economically important groups of bees because of their abundance in the landscape and the fact that they're generalist pollinators. So they could be valuable to us in food production. So overall, this collection showed us a few things. We found that bees are in fact present and pretty diverse in this edge habitat location along along active cropland. Um, it showed us that in an agricultural area like this, an economically important group of bees is present and very abundant. We also saw that uh, most of the bees we collected were generalists. However, specialists did occur in the landscape, which was kind of surprising given the low diversity of um, for flowering forbs in the area. And I want to point out most of the bees that we collect are very small. Um, and so I wanted to just say, you know, out of sight does not necessarily have to mean out of mind. It's easy to look at uh, an old field or a corner near, near some cropland and just assume there's not any insect, insect activity. There's no bee life out there because we can't really see a lot of the bees that are out there. They're so small. But this collection shows that even in areas that are a little less natural, there's a lot of pollinator activity going on. And those pollinators can be impacted by the land use and land management surrounding them. And just to leave you with something to think about, we started off talking about how uh, research is increasingly showing that our wild pollinators are in fact important to the quality and quantity of some of the food production going on in the country. And in our region, you know, uh, crops like corn and wheat and milo aren't necessarily uh, tied to pollinators to uh, achieve great yields. Um, but there are some implications um, that our wild pollinators can be helping in the background. It seems like the United States is kind of just catching up on research looking into um, how wild pollinators actually do benefit plants that we have long thought to be independent of pollinators to have great yields, you know, like cotton, canola, soybeans. Folks tend to think that, you know, they don't really need pollinators. They they take care of themselves. But there's growing evidence to support that um, there's increased yields and quality among these crops um, in the presence of our wild pollinators. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them.